Ready to break free from algorithms, vanity PR, and money-sucking ads? My name's Larissa Worstiak, and I've learned in seven years of jewelry marketing that content is the crown jewel. My agency, Joy Joya, takes a holistic approach, leading with laser-focused storytelling, impactful content creation, and strategic content distribution. This method has worked for the solopreneur as well as the multi-million dollar company. And now I'm sharing the same systems and tactics with you. Here's to standing out in the sea of sparkle. Welcome to episode 262. Let's kick things off a little differently today. Um, I'll start with a thought-provoking quote. So journalist Warren Berger once remarked, quote, Knowing the answers will help you in school. Knowing how to question will help you in life. End quote. Just think about that one for a second. I would say a common misconception I've observed among jewelry business owners is the belief in one single magical answer. They often feel that by following a specific XYZ formula that they'll achieve their sales targets seamlessly. But the reality is far from that. There is not a one-size-fits-all solution for success in the jewelry business or in any business for that matter. I would say through my interactions with diverse clients within this industry, I've realized that everyone's journey to success is unique to them. And the key is to navigate and discern this path, ideally sooner rather than later. But how in the world do you do that? You have to probe. You have to ask questions and not wait for some magical answer to just fall into your lap. It's all about mastering the art of asking the right questions, particularly when you do have data in front of you to look at. So in this episode, I want to shift our focus to the importance of curiosity and questioning especially about data. It's no secret that many solopreneurs in a creative field like jewelry are drawn to aesthetics, whether that's branding or their jewelry designs. But those same people, and maybe you can relate to this, you find yourself daunted by numbers, often presuming that you don't have the know-how to navigate your data. And you may feel like you're just missing out on some formula or hidden key. So I want to change that mindset. And instead of getting bogged down with every little data detail, instead, embrace your inquisitiveness, which I know that you have as a creative person. So begin by asking questions. Let yourself explore freely and embark on your journey of data discovery with an open heart and mind. We'll be looking at this topic through the lens of Hillary Fink Jewelry, who we've been spotlighting as a jewelry brand case study. For those of you joining this podcast series for the first time this season, I'd suggest starting with episode 252. That way you can meet Hillary and follow the journey from the beginning. For even more of a primer on this topic, go back to 233, which is all about key performance indicators or KPIs. Before we dive into our conversation with Hillary today, let's explore how you can become more inquisitive about your data. I'll talk about What insights might emerge when you allow your curiosity to take charge? And then how you can take actionable steps based on your newfound knowledge without the stress of thinking you need to be a data expert or believing that you need to have every answer in order to move forward and find success. But before we get to the solid gold, I'd like to take a moment to remind you that this podcast has both audio and video, so you can either listen on your favorite podcast platform or watch on YouTube by searching Joy Joya. You can support the podcast for free by taking the time not only to subscribe, but also to leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. Okay, my sparklers, let's get into today's episode. This one is all about getting 
curious. So first, I want to answer the question, how can you become more inquisitive or curious about your data, even if you're not a data expert and even if you are a little bit intimidated by the numbers related to your marketing? Well, first, let's talk about why this is so important to be data curious. We live in such an information-rich world to the point that we are overwhelmed by information, actually probably drowning in information. So being curious about data becomes so crucial because it can help you make better decisions, give you that competitive advantage, and ensure that you as a business owner or a leader within your business Don't get lost in that information overload. You can then be adaptable and you can reduce risk as the world around you, consumer preferences, the marketplace changes so quickly. So let's be curious and let's start to ask questions and make sense of what we're seeing in our business. There are a lot of misconceptions that you have to be a data expert in order to understand and utilize information effectively. So these are just some misconceptions that I hear from jewelry business owners. First, that it's very complex. Many believe that data is just complex. So they come to it already shut down. They don't want to understand it. They can't understand it. It's beyond them. That is a misconception. There's also this idea that you need like exclusive, secret, expensive tools. That's wrong. We can get data from some tools that we're already using in our business, or if not, we can find free sources or even low cost sources that are available to the normal business owner, not just to data experts. Then there are people who say, I'm just not a numbers person. Listen, I am guilty of this. I have said these words in my life. But when you do continue to say that, you pigeonhole yourself and you think that you're just not naturally inclined toward understanding the data side of your business and your marketing. And you need to just step out of that mindset because... If you went to elementary school and learned basic math, you can recognize patterns in your marketing. It does not require an advanced degree or advanced knowledge. The other thing is people get scared of data because they find it to be impersonal, that it's disconnected from human experience, that it's just so numbers driven that it kind of overlooks the qualitative or subjective aspects of your business. That doesn't have to be true. We can look at data in the context of what we know intuitively about our businesses and about our customers. And then some people think that data is just for corporations. So you probably believe as a small business owner or solopreneur that I don't have to pay attention to data because only Big organizations operate with data, and that is simply not true. So you, if you can challenge these misconceptions, then you can really empower yourself and the people you work with to engage more with data and leverage that for business growth. So how can you get more curious? I want you to adopt a learner's mindset to know that when it comes to data in marketing, it's okay to not know everything. Again, we are in data overload. The world is very complex. There is no one on this planet who knows all the things. So don't hold that standard up to yourself because you're not going to know all the things. And most importantly, I want you to embrace questions. There's so much value in asking why, how, what if, why is this happening? What does this mean? Get comfortable with asking questions. It doesn't mean that you're dumb or that you don't know anything. It actually means that you're smart and curious and inquisitive and that you're noticing things about your business. And that is really the beginning place from which you can improve and make positive change. 
Also get comfortable with engaging with different data sources. Yes, of course, a thing like Google Analytics is very important. Your social media analytics, very important. But there are so many other sources. Your customer feedback is a data point. Let's look at that in the context of all of other things. Let's take a really holistic view of your data. So don't get caught up in your data just being like your Shopify dashboard because there's so much more beyond that that you can be looking at. And there are so many online courses and workshops, even free ones. Google has a ton of resources to understand their analytics even Shopify, your email marketing platform. You can even look at Meta. Invest a few hours into yourself and into your business to understand how data works, even at the most basic level. And if you truly have no time or no money to invest in such a thing, then work with a pro who can set up a data dashboard for you and at least point out which key performance indicators or KPIs are the most important for you to be looking at so that at least you have some kind of like narrow view of what you can pay attention to rather than trying to learn it yourself. So what are the insights that might emerge when you really let your curiosity take charge of how you approach change in your business and improvement in your business? I would say data is just like a big mine of gems. There is, there's so much hidden narratives and emerging trends waiting to be uncovered there, just as if you were going to look for like diamonds in a mine. And when you analyze that data with curiosity, it reveals insights that can help you with decision making and even forecasting in the future. So to tap into that curiosity, I want you to just pick a single data point. Let's just start there and see what is it telling you. So in the interview with Hillary, that's coming in just a few minutes. One of the things that I looked at with her was her most viewed product categories over the past 12 months. For So when I say product categories, I mean like necklaces, bracelets, earrings, rings, etc., we want to understand, and this is not sales, this is just views on her e-commerce website, over the past year, which product ca categories had the most views, the least views, and what is the order of that? Knowing that not only helps us understand how to present those product categories, not only on the website, but in email marketing campaigns, on social media, but it also brings up curiosity. Me, as an outside consultant helping Hillary, approaching Hillary and asking her if what I'm seeing in the data matches her own experience with interacting with customers, if it matches the sales reports. So for example, if there was a big disconnect between what was most viewed and what was most sold, we would have to ask a lot of questions about that and see why is that happening? If there was a big disconnect between what was most viewed on the website versus what gets the most engagement on Instagram, again, we would have to get super curious about that and wonder, well, that's kind of interesting. Why is this happening? So just looking at the data, I'm not doing any crazy math formulas here. I'm not like, you know, coming up with any sort of like projections. We're just getting curious, trying to see patterns, having a conversation about whether this makes sense based on what we know and what we can do with this information. And you'll hear more about that when we talk to Hillary in a few minutes. I want you to explore patterns. You're in the jewelry industry you know what patterns are. We have visual patterns. You can see patterns. I believe that's true. So look at the numbers and say, or ask yourself, are there recurring trends, anomalies? You don't have to be a data expert to see a pattern. You have to be a visual thinker, which I know you are. So pay attention to patterns in your business and then see, are those patterns that we want to 
keep up? Or are those patterns that we want to break because they're not actually serving our business? And then you want to try your best to draw connections. So how does one data point relate to another? And I'll just give you one example of what I mean. So looking at your analytics, either through Google Analytics or even in your Shopify dashboard, you can see the average time that a visitor spends on your site. Okay, maybe it's like two minutes. Over the past 12 months, the average time is two minutes. And then look at the average order value or purchase amount. Do you see that those two have a correlation or are they not related? So maybe the longer or the higher your average time spent on site, you may see an increase in your average order value or you may not. It's really going to vary from one business to another. But those are the types of things where you can see relationships between one data point and another data point. So once you start getting curious and you feel comfortable about at least asking questions, being inquisitive, how can you then take actionable steps based on what you find? Again, without stressing over the fact like, I'm not a data expert, I don't have any every answer, how can I move forward? It's totally possible. You want to try your best to interpret what you find. Again, you don't have to be a data expert. You don't have to be a marketing expert. Just ask to the best of your ability, what does this mean for my business? And answer in a way that is just intuitive for you. If you're noticing something, but you're not able to draw a conclusion for it, just put a pin in in that It might make sense later once you have more information. Or if it's really nagging you, then that's a thing that you bring in an expert to help you with. And also with all the insights that you find, you want to prioritize it. So is there something that feels like it needs immediate attention because it's very concerning or very confusing? Or is it just a curiosity that maybe you want to circle back to, but it doesn't seem very important It doesn't seem to be negatively impacting your business. So make a priorities list of all the insights that you find. Once you know your priorities, you want to develop strategies, put action behind the things that you want to change. Even small changes can lead to really big impacts. So again, just being curious, let's say that we notice that necklaces are our most viewed product category by a lot. But on our website, we've kind of buried necklaces in the navigation. It seems like it's a little bit difficult to find necklaces. Perhaps a small change, maybe moving it higher up or in a more obvious place in the navigation, highlighting it more prominently on the homepage, because that is what it seems that visitors want to see, a small change like that could potentially make a big impact. But you need to remember, you're not just going to make that change and forget about it. You're going to see over time, if your curiosity, the small changes that you make are actually leading to results. So it's important to kind of track and monitor these things that you find in the actions that you take based on them. And please try to overcome your analysis paralysis. So again, you don't need all the answers to make a decision. So much of marketing is about making kind of like a best guess based on what you see. It's not just a gut decision, but you have to kind of keep moving the needle to make progress in your business. So small changes, again, like I said, trial and error in a data-driven way. So coming up in our chat with Hillary, we're going to get curious about some of Hillary's data and discuss how the insights and observations can potentially impact her marketing. Hey, Hillary, thanks for meeting today. I'm excited to talk about kind of some more data-based things around your business and how knowing the numbers, like how it makes you feel or intuitively how it compares with like what you know about your customers. Sounds great. Let's get started. Okay, so the first thing, I was looking back at the past year, so over the past 12 months, one thing that I noticed was the most viewed product category on your website was 
necklaces. And I don't know why I was surprised by that. Maybe it's because I just, you know, see your earrings or your rings on Instagram, but it kind of surprised me. And I was curious if that was something you already know and how does it match up with your sales data? Uh, I was not surprised by that because I do every year or just periodically throughout the year, I go ahead and like, you know, have QuickBooks put out a report for me that does show like the percentages of what my categories are selling and Mm -hmm. necklaces are always the highest. Um, And I think it has a lot to do with the orb necklaces. Um, And then I just checked this morning on what it is to date and necklaces and charms are over half of my sales. (laughs) Yeah. Which okay. Well, that's that, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I guess maybe it's just because of what I see from you on Instagram, but do you find that those things also get a good amount of engagement or necklaces? I mean, do you find that they get a good amount of engagement on social media or is it other products that tend to get more? The orbs get usually really great um, engagement. Yeah. And then like the diamond necklace that I posted a while ago, Um, that gets good engagement. It's more like people really like clear or like more like translucent or transparent types of pictures. And so I think that's why the orbs lend so nicely to Instagram because they just Mm -hmm. kind of set up perfectly. That makes a lot of sense. Okay. Well, I'm glad it's all, (laughs) it all matches up. Yeah. Um, Another thing that I thought was interesting in terms of website traffic that the silver pieces get slightly higher views than just the gold collection. And I was kind of curious about how that compares with like what you're promoting versus what actually is happening on the site. Um, Yeah. I mean, that was a little bit of a surprise to me because I am going in a more fine route over the last year or two. And I, I feel like the majority of my pieces are with gold, but I have been hearing from a few clients lately that they are really excited when I put out silver and that they would like some more silver pieces just because it's more in their price range. Mm -hmm. So I've definitely taken that into account and I'm, I'm happy to make pieces in silver. So, um, I just, I think it's, I think it's great feedback because I want to make sure that people can own a piece of my jewelry if they want to. Definitely. Yeah, that makes sense. And then from all the collection pages on your website, the one with the most average time. So like how much time people are spending looking at the page, it looked like captured was the one people spend the most time on, which is one of your two collections. And I was curious what you think about that. That's definitely not surprising. Um, That's the captured collection is my main. um, I mean, that's, I think that's how people know me. I think that's why people know my jewelry Um, and that is the bulk of my sales come from that collection. So, um, that makes a lot of sense and I promote it more anyway. So the thing that's usually surprising to clients is when they find out which product has the most views, because it's not often the one that like sells quickly or sells the most if you have more than one of them. And the one that it happened to be was a captured moonstone orb charm had the Mm -hmm. most views. And I'm curious what you thought about that. Yeah, that is, that's surprising just because it's, uh, it's just one of many, you know, I mean, it's, they're beautiful, but then I was thinking, oh, right. I had a few of them in stock a while ago. And so I created a banner for them on my website. You know, it was one of the like main pictures that comes up when you first go to my site and it was promoting the moonstone orbs. And I had that up for two or three months. So I mean, I'm guessing that that's what drove those numbers up. It was a pretty Mm -hmm. specific banner. I don't usually do those banners for such a specific item. Right. That makes sense. We were also talking to Hillary today in our meeting about how looking at traffic and what people are viewing can also help guide like um, product creation in the future. So maybe Moonstone is the thing you want to consider more of. Mm -hmm. People do love Moonstone and I do too. And I do have a good um, Moonstone uh, lapidary artist in India who um, I get them from, and he can cut them for me most of the t- most of the time. He, I don't know, he's funny about some cuts. It's like kind of one of those things, where like if if he wants to, you know, which I totally, if I totally understand that because I I just want to make things that I want to make. Um, but yeah, I could definitely get some more of those. 
One thing we were also talking to Hillary about was on her e-commerce site in the main navigation menu, we were thinking through maybe we should have a shop by gemstone option because her work is so focused or at least the captured collection is so focused on like the beauty of the gems themselves. So looking, thinking through that, we wanted to look through what are the most popular gems that people are at least looking at. I don't know if this matches like the purchase behavior, but what we saw, um, is was opal and then tourmaline and i was kind of curious if that was like surprising to you opal's definitely not and tourmaline kind of sort of not that big of a surprise um i do a decent amount of custom work with tourmaline when i get some nice tourmalines in i usually like put up pictures on instagram and say hey does anybody want some custom work but then there are some that are are left and i just make them for like you know my drops with my captured collection but opals no doubt people are still in love with opals i hope they stay in love with opals because i think they're fabulous and tourmaline and, and opal and especially opal are the stones that i plan on looking for um when i go to the tucson gem show this january it must be nice to feel like you have some like guidance in in your shopping rather than just like i don't know what to pick what looks pretty you know yeah there's guidance but there oh boy you definitely do get sucked into what looks pretty too it is i can can see that it's so intense (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I could totally see that. Yeah. Um, and there, that should be a thing because then that leaves you open to having some more like exclusive or limited edition stuff beyond like what you know is going to be popular already. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we were also looking at demographics of website visitors and I was very curious to know your reactions of, um, so 65% of people are from the US. That's probably not too surprising. But Hillary gets a lot of global traffic, mostly from the UK, Canada, Australia, France, Germany, Italy. So I was wondering like what you thought about that. I guess I'm surprised that from the US it's it's not higher. I'm surprised that 35% is global. That seems like a lot to me, but maybe that's maybe it's not. I've never really looked at those numbers before. Um, I do have some very good collectors in Australia and in the UK. So those two countries aren't much of a surprise. And I've shipped to um, Italy and then um, I've shipped to Singapore and Mexico. And then I've shipped to some Eastern European countries. But I the frat, the fact that like Germany and France comes up is a little surprising because I've, as far as I can remember, I, I don't have any purchasing clients from those countries yet. But um, a lot of times when I put out a, um, is it, what do you can do? You put out a newsletter and then you can go on to Shopify and it shows you real time views, mm-hmm. and it's it is fun to see like who's been on your site from around the world. So that is something that I look at from time to time. Yeah, it's always cool to see that you have that global influence with your jewelry. (laughs) And that's all Instagram. I mean, that's just from people. I think that's just from people finding me on Instagram. It's such a, it's just such a blessing. So one thing I was definitely surprised about, but it might actually connect to what you just said about Instagram is that most users to your site are between the ages of 25 and 34, which I thought was on the low end. I was <laughs> so surprised. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then 35 to 44 was the second highest. And even that seemed low. As yeah. when you can tell me what your target audience is. I mean, I just always thought it was like 40 and up, 40 to 55. Yeah. Um, And so, yeah, and it makes me now, I just want to know so badly, like, I wish I knew the ages of my customers. I mean, obviously it's not something you can ask, but, um, Mm -hmm. oh, and I'm just so curious now because, you know, a lot of these people purchase from my site and I don't, I don't know who they are. Like maybe they're people that I chat with from Instagram, but so many I've, I've never met. I have no idea who they are. And I, especially my repeat clients, I want to know, I want to know more about them. Um, but yeah, the age the age really surprises me. Yeah, it was surprising to me too. I had to like do a double take when I saw those numbers because it wasn't what I was expecting. Um, Why do you think it's then, so low? Yeah. Why do you think the age is so low? Do you think it's just I don't know. that age surfs the internet a lot or, or 
Because I'm not sure if they're the purchasers, though. Yeah, I'd have to kind of compare it with the demo of your Instagram followers. My Mm -hmm. guess is like, you know, Instagram users tend to be older, Gen Z, millennial, maybe people are finding you on Instagram and going to your website. It's kind of hard to know. Mm -hmm. Um, But that's a hunch that I would have about it. Mm -hmm. And then also 71% are female. What did you think about that? I I think that's great that there's 30% are men. That also surprised yeah. me that there's that many men searching for my jewelry. I think that's great. Yeah. And that's why Hillary needs to release some men's stuff. <laughs> I need to make some men's. Yes. I mean, I've been, I, I've had cufflinks on my list for like two years now. And um, mm-hmm. well, I guess it's time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then another thing Google breaks down, which this is kind of, it's not like hyper accurate, but it does give you an idea of like what people's interests are, like what else they're browsing on the, the internet. And the interests of the, her website visitors are media and entertainment and movie lovers, and then food and dining and cooking enthusiasts. And then third was home and garden and home decor, which I thought was kind of interesting. <laughs> the second two makes sense to me because I feel like people who are into food and dining, I feel like that means they have like expendable income. Right. Um, Mm -hmm. And same with home garden and home decor. If you're into those things, you probably have a little bit of extra money to throw around from time to time. So then you can do it with for jewelry too. Plus I love to garden and I have a vegetable garden and I have roses in my backyard and I post those pretty regularly in my stories. And I do have like some conversations with some other people that love to garden that we kind of like all follow each other and comment on each other's, you know, flowers and things like that. But the first category, I was like, what media and entertainment and movie lovers? Like how, isn't that everyone? Doesn't everyone? Yeah, I know. And that seems like a cop out. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that was funny to me. It does. Just talking to you today, I'm like, hmm, maybe we need to do like a customer survey or something of like your top collectors to. just so we could actually learn more about them. You know, I would love to know more about them. And I, <laughs> I've always wanted to, but I think what I've heard from just different people I've talked to is that it's really hard to get a good re- number of responses to have the data mean anything, Mm -hmm. but sometimes it's nice. Well, maybe even just like five people fill it out. And then I just know more about those five clients, you know, I I agree. It could be hard to get a good, like average kind of sample, but even just to your point, knowing even a five of your clients better would Mm -hmm. help you understand a little bit more in general, because I'm Mm -hmm. sure they share some kind of characteristics with like other people who are attracted to your jewelry. Yeah. And The clients that I do know, I have to say it's really, I don't know how it is for other types of industries, but I think it's really, really fun to know your jewelry clients just because jewelry is so Mm -hmm. personal and so meaningful. And it's really fun for me. Like when I was just in um, Santa Fe and Taos a few weeks ago for my birthday, one of my collectors who lives in Taos, she had us over for brunch. And I had never met her. We only like message email or Instagram. And it was just like, it was so lovely to have that closer connection with one of my clients. So I, I love, I love getting to know my clients. What a cool experience. I like that. It was great. Yeah, (laughs) it was really nice. So basically if you're one of Hillary's clients and you're listening to this, you should invite her to brunch. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, you know, I'll travel wherever it's all travel expenses. So yeah. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Write it off for the business. (laughs) Um, Uh, Well, Thanks, Hillary. It was fun going through some of these interesting facts and it definitely gave me some new ideas also. Yeah. I thought it was really, really interesting finding this, this information. Yeah. It's pretty cool. What did you think about today's interview? Are you excited to keep following Hillary on this journey? I highly encourage you to check out Hillary's website, hillaryfink.com and follow her on Instagram at Hillary Fink Jewelry. And I'll put those links in the show notes as well. Let me know in a podcast review or YouTube comment what you think. Okay. Let's get into the gold mine. This is a segment where I get personal and share insights on entrepreneurship, mindset, success, growth, 
all things business. This week's gold mine, I want to talk about recent experience I had. So if you don't follow me on Instagram where you haven't seen, I had the privilege to attend the Istanbul Jewelry Show in Turkey, where I moderated a panel called Secrets to Success in Social Media and Digitization in the Jewelry Industry. So this panel featured five distinguished influencers from diverse jewelry niches from all over the world, as well as the CEO of a jewelry company called Arpush. So I'll put the links to all the social media handles of the influencers in the show notes if you're interested in checking out their content, because it's a lot to list here, but you can look in the links if you're curious. So throughout my career in this industry, I've had the chance to interact with many jewelry influencers, but I would say that Sharing a stage at the Istanbul Jewelry Show with five of them was a unique experience. What really struck me about being able to like interview them in this setting was their passion, their enthusiasm, and their professionalism in representing the brands they work with and really ensuring that all the content they put out into the world resonates with their unique audience and their followers. So these people, they're not just merely dabbling in social media. They're dedicated pros who understand what their audiences want. And even though they're all in the jewelry industry and most, if not all of them, are representing fine jewelry, they all have a slightly different approach in how they engage. And their commitment is so evident in how meticulously they curate content and uphold the best practices of the platforms they use, like Instagram, for example. And during this panel, I really realized, I mean, I kind of knew already, but it truly hit me that influencers are so vital and irreplaceable in today's digital age. I think you know the term influencer sometimes has negative connotations because influencers can potentially be inauthentic. There's various controversies about influencers. But I think when an influencer is really committed to the niche and the industry that they're in, they exemplify the authentic and positive impact the best of when it comes to influencer marketing. And in the jewelry domain, especially with these influencers who were on the panel, they're able to weave narratives and evoke desire in ways that even brands, even the most legacy, most popular, most coveted brands cannot do. The audiences of these influencers, they are eagerly awaiting with bated breath the content. And if you look at the comments and the engagement on these influencers' posts, it's such a testament to the passion that these people can infuse even on a digital platform like Instagram, where they're not interacting in person, but yet there's still such a personal element of how they're able to connect with and captivate their followers. And as a business owner or a leader within a jewelry business, I want you to know that there are so many insights that you can glean from influencers looking at them, how they engage their audience, how they handle storytelling. And even if you personally don't like influencer marketing, and even if you don't choose to partner with influencers in your own marketing strategy, again, I think that's fine. This is not necessarily an endorsement for everyone to work with influencers, but I think whether or not you do, it's so important to look at them, to see their approach to platforms like Instagram, to see how they're able to create engagement, encourage engagement, and bring some of that to your own strategy in engaging with your followers and your customers, because there's so much to learn. So reflect on this today. I want you to think about who influences 
you and what captivates you about that person or organization or entity. It doesn't even have to be within the jewelry space, but there has to be someone or something that kind of prompts you to look at the world more differently. I don't even mean like this person makes you buy stuff. They just make you see things in a different light or make you pay attention, sit up and take notice. There has to be someone or something that does that for you. And then in your own marketing, is there an aspect or an energy or an approach that you can channel and bring to what you do so that you can kind of be the quote unquote influencer and storyteller and desire maker, (laughs) desire creator of your own brand's narrative. I think there's something we can all learn by paying attention to these tastemakers, let's say. So what do you think? Let me know in an Instagram DM, podcast review, or YouTube comment. Did you have any questions about today's episode? You can always email me Larissa, that's L-A-R-Y-S-S-A at joyjoya.com. If you love this podcast, please share it with a friend who'd appreciate it. And don't forget to subscribe as well as leave a review on Apple Podcasts. If you're completely new to digital marketing, then you'll want to purchase and read a copy of my book, Jewelry Marketing Joy. Visit joyjoya.com book for more information.